Hi everyone, welcome to Lecture 11H of Useful Genetics, where we're going to talk about circulating cell-free DNA, DNA that is circulating in our bloodstream, but not inside our cells, floating around free. We'll talk about, in particular, three roles that this DNA can play. One is fetal DNA maternal blood, which can be very useful for prenatal diagnosis. We'll talk about how transplanted organs release DNA into the recipient circulation and how that DNA can be used to monitor the progress of the transplant. And we'll talk about the possibility that the DNA of cancer cells can be used to optimize treatment. So our blood contains fragments of our DNA just floating around loose. In fact, there's quite a bit of it. The source is cells that die in our bodies. Old cells are always being killed off and tidied away, but some of the DNA escapes and just floats around in the circulation. Um, this is the standard cause of DNA in all healthy people. The concentration of this DNA in healthy people is between 10 and 100 nanograms per mil. Now a nanogram is a pretty teeny bit. It's a million billionth, it's a billionth of a gram, which is already a pretty small piece. So that sounds like hardly anything. But in fact, when you consider the size of the DNA, there's about 10 to the 11th, that's 100 billion fragments of DNA in every mill of our blood. That's not a tiny bit, that's a ton of DNA. The fragments are quite small. I put in again this picture of the way DNA is packaged in chromosomes because the size of the fragments is thought to correspond approximately to the amount of DNA that's wrapped around one nucleosome in when the DNA is packaged. Most of this DNA turns over quite quickly in our blood. So new DNA is constantly being produced and the existing DNA is constantly being cleared away probably by our kidneys. Now, a big, very valuable use for this DNA came with the realization that when women are pregnant, their blood not only contains their own DNA, it contains DNA from the fetus as well. And it's produced by the same processes, by the death of cells that aren't needed anymore in the fetus. Most of this is DNA from the cells of the placenta. So, a substantial fraction of the DNA in a pregnant woman's blood is of fetal origin. Um, it's relatively small amounts early in the pregnancy and gets larger as the fetus gets larger. Um, it also is larger in problem pregnancies than in healthy pregnancies. It's possible to determine how much of the DNA comes from the fetus using particular enzymes, a particular nuclease, that's sensitive to the methylation pattern of the DNA. There are some nucleases that will cut at specific sequences only if the DNA doesn't have the methyl groups on it, typical of the cytosine methylation that, for instance, determines imprinting. And it's known that there are a number of sites where the methylation pattern of the maternal DNA is different than that of the fetal DNA. So by incubating DNA from the maternal bloodstream with this nuclease, it's possible to compare the amount of DNA at the sites that differ between the mother and the fetus with that at the sites where the mother and the fetus have the same methylation and to thereby calculate how much of the DNA in the mother's blood is fetal, blood, is fetal DNA. So identifying fetal DNA in maternal blood is very valuable because it can be used to genotype the fetus before birth. Um, the simplest case is detecting the gender of the child because all that's needed is to do a polymerase chain reaction amplification of a Y chromosome sequence. If it amplifies, you're having a boy. Another use is to determine the genotype of the fetus for known alleles. This is particularly straightforward if it's an allele that the father has but not the mother, because then it's simply a matter of testing the total mother's DNA for the presence of this 
um, paternal allele. If it's present, then the child got that allele from its father. If it's not there, then the fetus didn't. Um, more complicated is situations where both parents are heterozygous for a recessive mutation, and you're concerned whether the fetus may be homozygous. For instance, if both were heterozygous for cystic fibrosis mutation. This is where being able to distinguish between fetal DNA and maternal DNA is very valuable. Um, it's also useful for detecting aneuploidies. This is, again, a little tricky because you're not looking for differences in sequences, looking for differences in the copy number of the sequences. And so it's necessary to sequence fetal DNA from all the chromosomes and look for differences in sequence coverage between the chromosomes. For instance, if triploidy is present, you'll see more sequences from one chromosome than from the others. If um, monosomy, you'd expect to see fewer sequence reads from that chromosome than the other chromosomes. What's really valuable about these methods is that they're non-invasive. They only require a blood sample from the mother. The benefits come very clear when you think about Down syndrome. So conventional tests for Down syndrome are both expensive and risky because they're invasive. They have to take fetal cells from within the woman's uterus. And there's always a significant risk of inducing a miscarriage. But with blood tests on maternal DNA in the maternal blood, you can, there's no risk of inducing a miscarriage. And it's also, um, taking blood is a much more economical procedure than sampling fetal cells from within the woman's uterus. So d data from um, Chinese studies shows that these tests are also much more accurate than the conventional Down syndrome testing. Um, they tested more than 10,000 pregnancies. And in there they got, they reported no false negative results and only one false positive test. Now, you may be going, wait, what's a false negative and a false positive again? So I made you a little diagram. So here we're thinking about trisomy. So we have four kinds of results, a true positive, a true negative, false positive, and false negative. What you want your test to give you is a very low frequency of false positives and a very low frequency of false negatives. So a true positive would be when the test says it's, the baby has a trisomy and the baby really does have a trisomy. A true negative would be when the test says that the baby is normal and the baby really is normal. False positives occur when the test says the baby has a trisomy but it doesn't or when the test says the baby is normal, but it isn't. Those are both very distressing for the parents and very much outcomes to be avoided. It's even possible to use fetal DNA in maternal blood for genome sequencing, to sequence the fetus's genome. This isn't easy, and as yet, it's not a very um, clinically important procedure. This was more just to show that it could be done. The researchers sequenced both of the parents' genomes, and then they sequenced the blood in the DNA in the maternal bloodstream, of which 13% was fetal, and they were able, mostly by a process of um, subtraction, of saying, well, that's a maternal sequence, that's a paternal sequence, they were able to accurately infer the actual sequence of the baby. Now, circulating cell-free DNA, this is the um, acronym, the abbreviation for this DNA, circulating cell-free DNA, can be used in other circumstances than pregnancy as well. Um, in particular, it's very useful, it's being discovered, for 
charting the progress of a organ transplant because this is a situation where the the donor and the recipient have very different sequences and so this is results from a very recent paper where they showed that they were tracking patients after heart transplants and what they found was that the percent of donor DNA in the DNA in the bloodstream in the total cell free DNA could be as high as 10 percent immediately after an organ transplant but it, that it rapidly fell to almost undetectable and as long as the transplant was being accepted the levels stayed very low but if the transplant was being rejected levels would rise again and this served as a warning to the clinicians that the patient was at risk of rejecting the transplant and that perhaps it was time to consider changing their immunosuppression therapy to try to protect the um, transplanted organ from rejection. Now, finally, there's now quite a bit of talk about the possibility of using circulating cell-free DNA for cancer diagnosis and treatment. And that's because cancer cells do release quite a lot of DNA into the circulation. Cancer cells, although they're growing fast, they're sloppy, and there is quite a lot of cell death associated with the growth of tumors. So that there's substantial cancer cell DNA in the circulation. In principle, this could be used to diagnose tumors, um, to design treatment, optimize treatment according to the genotype of the tumor, it could be used to detect changes in the tumor burden, the amount of tumor tissue in the body during or after chemotherapy. It could be used to detect mutations that are making the tumor resistant to chemotherapy. But so far, this is largely somewhat speculative because cancer cells, they're not like donor cells in an organ transplant. Cancer cells differ from normal cells at only a few genes. And so you need to know exactly what genes to look at if you want to detect the tumor cells against the background of the host, the, the person's healthy cells. Further, as we described, the genotypes of tumor cells can vary within a single patient. And so you're often looking at the average genotype over all the tumor population in the patient, which may not be very helpful. So we've talked about cell-free DNA in our blood, in particular about fetal DNA circulating in the blood of a pregnant woman and how that can be used for non-invasive prenatal genotyping that's cheaper, easier, safer, and often more accurate than the conventional methods. We talked about how circulating DNA can also be used to monitor the progress of an organ transplant and we talked about the possibility that it can be used for um, improving cancer therapies. Coming up next, for all you seniors taking the course, I know you're out there, we're going to talk about the genetics of aging. I hope to see you there.